Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome back to Ms. Linda's virtual classroom. Uh, we are getting close to the end of Granny Torelli Makes Soup. So I'm going to get right into it. When we left off yesterday, we had met a new character, Janine, who moved in uh, to the same neighborhood as Rosie and Bailey. And Rosie finally told Bailey what was, what was bothering her. She had asked the question if Bailey would like... If, if Bailey would like Janine better than he liked Rosie and he gave the question he gave the answer I don't think so which was not what Rosie wanted to hear so uh, she's a little bit angry right now and we're going to read on and see what happens I also want to point out to you that um, Granny Torelli seems to leave the kitchen often to take a pause have you noticed that? Why do you think Granny Torelli leaves the kitchen to take a pause? I, I have noticed that she does it under two different circumstances. Sometimes she leaves the kitchen, for instance, when she was working alone with Rosie, she would leave the kitchen to take a pause and that would give Rosie a chance to think about all the things that she had been talking about with Granny Torelli. And now that Bailey is there as well, when Granny Torelli leaves the kitchen to take a pause, it means that Rosie and Bailey need to work out their issues with each other without Granny Torelli there all the time. Okay, so, but let's read on. Today's chapter that we're beginning with is called Snakes. Granny takes a look around, senses that maybe her pause should have been even longer, looks as if she's debating whether or not to leave the room again, but then she steps purposefully to the counter and lifts the bowl of dough. Bene, she says, I will do my little miracles and then we will make the snakes. Snakes, Bailey says. Fun part, Granny says, you'll see. She sprinkles flour on one of the pastry boards, dumps the dough onto it, and then she kneads and pats and rolls the pasta with her hands. So graceful, so gentle, until the dough is gleaming and smooth. No more sticky patches. It looks beautiful. Then she shapes the dough into an oval and takes the big knife and slices off pieces, each one the size of a tiny lemon. And she places one lemon-sized piece in front of each of us. Flower your hands, she says, like this. She shows Bailey by letting him feel her, her own hands. Now you make the snakes. Rosie, show Bailey. I glare at her. I am not wanting to show Bailey. Granny winks at me. I move over beside Bailey and take his hands and put them on the dough with my hands on top of his. I show him how to roll with his fingers so the dough will get longer and thinner. I stop being mad at Bailey while my hands are on his. Oh, I get it, he says. And so I let go of his hands and stand back, watching as he swiftly rolls his dough into a perfect snake. Inside, I am thinking good things and terrible things. I want to stay there watching Bailey forever. I want him never to leave. I do not want him ever to be with Janine. I hate Janine for coming to live in our neighborhood. I want the snakes to be real and slither off the table and under the door and over Janine's and... You're going to help... You going to help us, Rosie? Granny Torelli says, jolting me out of my head, bringing me back to the kitchen and the dough. We make all the snakes and then Granny tells me to chop them up. So I chop each snake into little inch long pieces. I love the next part when we make the little cavatelli. Now cavatelli is a type of pasta. They're making it from scratch at home. Show Bailey, will you, Rosie? Granny Torelli says, and I am happy to put my hand on Bailey's again and dip his fingers in the flour and then show him how to make one of the little pieces and roll it with his four, how to take one of the little pieces and roll it with his forefinger against his thumb. Pressing in, as he rolls, so the perfect shape is made. It looks like a little dough canoe. Bene, bene, Granny Torelli says, sitting across from us, watching me and Bailey, side by side, making the little dough canoes, the cavatelli. And for a time, it is peaceful in the kitchen, and I am outside myself, a calm place to be. Okay. 
Next chapter we are going to read is sauce. If you're making pasta, of course you need sauce, don't you? All the cavatelli are spread out on the floured board where they will dry. Granny Torelli says, bene, bene, now it's sauce time. And she has her nose in the refrigerator and is pulling out spare ribs and ground beef and eggs and garlic and onion and tomatoes. From the cupboard, she snatches salt and pepper and oregano and bay leaves and olive oil. I am the director, she says. Let's get this production moving. Granny dribbles olive oil in the big red pot while Bailey and I chop onions and garlic and then we toss them in the pot. And what a smell in that kitchen. What a good, good smell. Spare ribs, Granny directs, and Bailey plunks the spare ribs in the pot where they sizzle. Tomatoes chopped, Granny says, and so we chop all the tomatoes while Granny opens the wee can of tomato paste, the thick red sticky paste that will go in the pot with the tomatoes. As the spare ribs are browning, I can't help it, so I say, so whatever happened to Violetta? Phew, Granny Torelli says, settling herself on the chair and sniffing the good smells in the kitchen. Here is the good thing that happened. Marco. Who's Marco? Bailey says. Granny Torelli grins a little grin, a little girl grin, full of mischief. Very cute boy. Comes to stay with his grandmother next door to me. Very smart boy, too. And molto charming. Granny smiles at the ceiling as if Marco, the cute, smart, charming boy, is floating up there. What does Marco have to do with Violetta? Ah, Granny Torelli says, everything. She waves her hand at the tomatoes. Tomatoes in the pot, she directs. We obey. Stir tomato paste. Two cans of water. Stir. Now where were we, she says. Marco, Bailey says. Ah, si, si, Marco. So Marco comes to stay next door, and Marco finds me very enchanting. Really, that is the word he used, enchanting. It's different in Italian, but you understand what I'm saying. I am enchanting. That Granny Torelli makes me laugh. She makes Bailey laugh, too. So Marco is at my house day and night, hanging around like a sick donkey. Please will I come out and walk with him. Please will I come for dinner. Please, please, please. Bailey's head is tilted upward again, his thinking pose. Granny Torelli flicks her fingers at the red pot, bubbling with all the good smells. Bay leaf, oregano, two pinches, salt, three pinches, pepper, lots. We toss it all in and stir. Bailey says, and what did Pardo think of Marco? <laughs> Granny Torelli claps her hands together. Pardo hated him. Couldn't stand the sight of him. I am trying to picture it. There is a little play going on in my head. There is Pardo swooning over Violetta and Granny Torella monster cutting Violetta's hair and Violetta ending up looking like a movie star and then Marco moving in and swooning over my Granny Torelli and Pardo hating Marco. Bailey is nodding. I get it, he says. The shoe is on the other foot now. Yes, how you say? Bullseye. You hit a bullseye, Bailey boy. At first, I do not get it, though, Granny Torelli says. At first, I think... Why is my life such a mess? Why did that Violetta have to come and steal Pardo's heart? And why did this Marco boy have to come and be such a nuisance? And when she says that, I am thinking, why did that Janine girl have to come? Why, why, why? And I am wanting to hear more, but Granny Torelli says, stop, meatballs. She pushes a bowl in front of Bailey, motions for me to get the ground meat and eggs and salt and onions, and soon we are mushing our hands in the meat, mush, squishing it and squeezing it, and the garlic, onion, spare ribs, bay leaf, oregano, tomatoes are swirling in the big pot, and all the smells are wrapping around us, and I am dizzy with it, with the smells and the squished meat and the play going on in my head. And I want to know everything, everything, what happened with Violetta and Pardo and Marco and Granny Torelli? And what will happen with me and Bailey and Janine? And why is there no Marco who finds me enchanting? All right, so we have to add another character to our board here. And that character is part of our flashbacks. So Marco goes over here. Marco, I guess, would be called a little bit of a love triangle because, uh, well, it's actually four people. So Granny Torelli 
was in love with Pardo. And then Violetta came along and took Pardo's attention. And now Marco has come along and is taking Granny Torelli's attention and making Pardo very angry. So we have quite a soap opera going on here. I'm going to read one more chapter today. This chapter is called The Yellow House. Now, do you know what Yellow House we're talking about? When I saw this chapter, I remembered a detail that didn't seem like an important detail when I read it a few, a few days ago. So when, when Bailey was telling Granny Torelli about Janine in the chapter called What's New, um, Bailey says, Janine moved into the old wicker house. You know which one? And Granny says, the yellow one across from you? And Bailey says, no, the green one. Yellow one still empty. Okay, so we know there were two houses across the street from Bailey, a green one and a yellow one. Janine moved into the green house. The yellow house is still empty. Now we are going to read a chapter called The Yellow House. What happens next is so strange that I wonder if it is the play in my head and not what is really happening. I am standing there with my hands in the meatball mush and Bailey's hands are right there in the bowl with mine and I see a big truck coming slowly down the street, a moving van. It stops across the street, three doors down. I don't believe it, I say. What, Bailey says. Granny's eyes follow mine. She stares out the window, smiles a little smile. Moving van, I say. Looks like it's stopping in front of that empty house, almost across from yours, Bailey, the yellow one. Very funny, Bailey says. No, really, Bailey, really, really. I take my hands out of the mush, go to the sink, stare out the window. A car pulls up behind the moving van. Two cars, in one, a woman and a little girl. In the other car, a man and two boys, maybe twins, maybe my age, maybe a little older. Bailey has joined me at the sink. Tell me, he says. I describe what I see. I tell him about the moving van and the two cars about, uh, and the two cars about the man and woman and little girl. I tell him, oh, how casually I tell him about the two boys, maybe twins. I don't believe it, he says. He is agitated, annoyed, hating that he can't see for himself if I am telling him the truth. I beam at Granny Torelli. Well, 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 I think. Double Marco. Ah, so we are coming to the end of our book. I am checking right now. I only have one more day left to read to you. So let's make a prediction. Now that we have had two boys, maybe twins, about the same age as... Uh, Rosie, maybe a little bit older, maybe a year older. What is your prediction? What will happen with these two boys living in the neighborhood? How will Rosie feel about that? And how will Bailey feel about that? So those are the questions I'm leaving you with today. I would love to hear from you. My email is mislindateacher104 at gmail.com. Uh, please email me with any questions, any comments. As we get to the end of this book now, if you have any suggestions for the next read aloud I should do, I would love that and I will consider some suggestions. And as always, have a great day. Keep on reading, boys and girls. <laughs>